All right. Hello, everybody. I see we are still filtering in, pouring in more like, hello, hello, everyone. <laughs> All right, I'm just waiting a few seconds to let everybody get in here and get situated. All righty. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to go ahead and just start talking. Hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our little virtual event room here. Uh, I'm Allie. I've got my whole airline pilot get up here for our <laughs> long distance uh, event situation. Um, if you are local, you might recognize me from the Lake Forest Park location. And I am so, so excited to be introducing Alexander McCall Smith here to discuss his books, Pianos and Flowers and How to Raise an Elephant. So before we get into the fun stuff, I just want to really quickly thank you guys so, so much for tuning in and for buying books. Your guys' support really is what keeps us going and we really love what we do. So if you also love what we do, we'd appreciate it very much if you would swing by, come on in, we're open, grab copies. Um, and if you're not local, we do ship. Uh, shipping is $3.50 for the first book and a dollar uh, for each one after that. Um, and you get to support USPS too. So that is a little added bonus. Um, I will be linking books in the chat, so they'll be easy to find. Um, while you're over on the website, I definitely recommend checking out some of our other upcoming events or sign up for our newsletter. We have a really exciting roster coming up for the new year. Um, and it's just, a, it's like a once a week email. We're not going to spam you. It just tells you the basic stuff that's going on in the bookstore, blog posts that we have, recommendations, um, you know, community activities, just good stuff, just good stuff. Um, or of course, you can always follow us at Third Place Books. We're on pretty much every major social media platform for just the quickest recommendations and updates. And, you know, we do fun stuff over there too, fun themed book lists and just silly things that uh, the booksellers get excited about. So definitely go check that out and see if there's anything over there for you. Um, so we are gonna be here for about an hour and uh, towards the end of our little meet here, we definitely will be taking questions. So if you have any questions, by all means, throw those into the Q&A. Uh, there's a Q&A box down at the bottom or the top of your screen, depending on what device you're on. Um, there's both a Q&A box and a chat. So the chat, definitely get in there, say hi, tell us where you're from, connect with each other. We love to see that so much. But for questions, definitely put the questions in the Q&A so that once we get to the part where we're, uh, where we're doing the question and answer part, it's easy to find what you guys want to know. Um, and I think that's all of my housekeeping. So really quickly, ah, hello from Munich. <laughs> Um, without further ado, Alexander McCall Smith is the author of the number one ladies detective agency novels and a number of other series and standalone books. His works have been translated into more than 40 languages and have been bestsellers throughout the world. Um, today, he's here to discuss his new books, Pianos and Flowers, which imagines the lives and loves of everyday people pictured in 20th century photographs. And of course, how to Raise an Elephant, the 21st book in his beloved number one ladies detective agency series. So thank you so much for being here. I am so excited to be a fly on the wall in this uh, conversation. Um, if anyone needs anything, of course, give me a shout. I will be invisible but listening. Um, and the rest of you, I'm gonna leave you in his uh, capable hands. Um, of course, I will be back here for questions. Have a good time. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. And uh, here we are 
Uh, hello, everybody. It's, it's a very great pleasure to be with you through this uh, wonderful uh, technology. Uh, as I'm talking to you, I see uh, down at the, uh, the bottom of the screen uh, various messages from people who are with us this evening. And uh, it's marvelous to see uh, where everybody is, is, is coming from. Uh, obviously, a lot of people in the Seattle uh, area and in, in, in Washington uh, state generally, but uh, there's somebody coming from uh, New York City, which is, uh, which is very nice. We had people coming in from Melbourne. So this, this is one of the great uh, benefits of, of these particular um, forms of, uh, of events. Obviously, <clears throat> I think we all miss uh, the physical events. I, I very much uh, miss the, the, the touring, the events that I do and the tours where I manage to meet people in the, in, in the flesh. Uh, but there are consolations, and one of the uh, real consolations is this ab ability to perhaps speak to more people in, in more places. Of course, Seattle is a place in which I've, I, I've uh, often done events in the, in the past. It's always a very uh, great pleasure to be in, in that part of the, uh, of the United States. Uh, I very much like the, uh, the Pacific North, uh, Northwest, so uh, great to be in Seattle, and I can just imagine it. I'm speaking to you from um, Edinburgh in Scotland, which is where I live. So I'm on the other side of the world, really. There's eight hours difference uh, between yourselves and, uh, and, and us. And so it's, it's an evening. It's, been, it's quite a pleasant evening. It's been a pleasant, pleasant day here. Uh, a certain amount of sunshine, which is nice at this time of the, of the year. And uh, I'm speaking to you from my um, study here in my house in, in Edinburgh. It's a Victorian house built about um, 1880, 1880-ish, uh, and it's on the it's 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 on the edge of town, and it sense Edinburgh isn't a, a very big city. I should imagine uh, many of you will have been in Edinburgh, and you know it's the sort of place where you can walk around quite easily. I can walk from where I'm sitting here in um, in our house uh, to the centre of town in about 25 minutes, which is which is great uh, in these days of very large cities and. Uh, uh, to be able to 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 walk about town means that you can actually um, yeah, well I think you can just stay in touch with people a little bit more which of course is what we really are missing at the moment in that um, although we can talk to people on Zoom and we're we're, we're continuing to have telephone conversations and so on um, actually not not being able to have people into the house is is quite an odd thing and I'm sure that many of you who are experiencing similar restrictions at the moment. Uh, are feeling that it's it's been a very odd experience. It's as if our all our social networks have been in a in a rather curious way um, cut off. Um, it's it's marvelous when when I find if I get a telephone call from a friend, for example, there's a a wonderful sense of relief that people still exist, that the world is going on around uh, our, out there. Of course, we're going to get through it. We'll get through it. And um, uh, I think that one of the things which uh, is helping us all in uh, these pretty trying times uh, are books. I, I'm certainly finding that I'm reading more. Um, I have uh, large piles of, of, of books around the house that I, uh, I don't always finish them. Uh, I, I plead guilty to starting some books and then uh, forgetting where I am and then discovering uh, that they've been sitting there for a year or two. But uh, I've been reading more. I've also had, I think, a little bit more time to think uh, interestingly enough, I, I think that we've all had more quiet brought to our lives and uh, we've been able to reflect on things that maybe we haven't thought very much about uh, in the past because we've been so busy. Uh, interestingly enough, when all this started, uh, I was reading um, two books on monasticism of all subjects. Uh, one was uh, Patrick Lee Fermor's uh, book, A Time to Keep, Keep Silence, uh, which is um, uh, all about uh, how he went to a number of uh, French monasteries in the 1950s, and he describes staying in these, these monasteries. And another one was by a uh, contemporary abbot of, of a monastery uh, down in England. And uh, he was talking about the relevance of, of mon monasticism and isolation and, and, and silence uh, for the 21st century. Now, both of these books obviously had been written before uh, this, uh, what, what, what had happened. And uh, so it was just the right time to be reading those because it made me think about, made me think about time to reflect and um, how uh, our lives have, I think, become excessively uh, busy 
and there's been a bit of a corrective in in that uh, in that respect. Anyway, <clears throat> here we are. Um, this, as I say, is my my study. This is where I I do a lot of my writing. Uh, I I'm one of these these authors who can write in in any circumstances. I'm happy to say, uh, in that I'm quite happy to write on planes and trains and in hotels. Uh, so I write as I as I go around. I do quite a bit of touring normally in normal circumstances, and so I'll often be writing a book while I'm while I'm touring and talking talking to people about it. I remember some years ago I was on tour in the United States and I was sitting in an aeroplane and I was uh, writing. Um, a, a new volume in my Scotland Street series. And I noticed on the other side of the aisle, uh, there was a woman who was sitting there reading a previous book in the, in the series. So that was a bit of a coincidence. So I, I leaned across the aisle and I said, there'll be another one of those, which I'm working on at the moment. And she looked at me and initially <laughs> she was a little bit worried. She almost sort of rang the bell for the, <laughs> for the attendant, uh, because uh, these days, unfortunately, you don't speak to people in, in planes anymore. You used to speak to people in planes, but now we can happily sit um, for eight hours in the company of somebody else on a long flight, uh, for example, and not talk to them, which seems to me to be a rather odd situation. Um, we're, we're in danger of losing the art of conversation. Conversation is, is, is terribly, uh, important, and uh, I think that uh, we're we're being so we're so used to I suppose being uh, cocooned in our little electronic universes when we travel, where we're, we're watching something or listening to something or talking to somebody on our, our cell phone, and we don't re we aren't really in touch with them. Uh, but there we are. Uh, that's another matter. So here I am in this in this study. That I'm going to adjust the camera a little bit like that. That's my desk where I write. Um, a lot of the books. Um, you'll see it's a bit of a, a mess in front, actually. I should have tidied it up before we started this evening. Uh, I hope you're not too, uh, too uh, shocked by the, the mess. And mind you, everybody's desk is a mess if it comes down to it. Uh, people who say their desk isn't a mess are really uh, are, are concealing something. Uh, what I find every so often, I clear it up, which means moving the papers from, from there to the uh, the larger pile of papers in the in the corner over there. So that's what I call uh, organization or clear out. And then you'll see uh, there are the um, the books on one. There I can't show you the the other walls very easily, uh, but that's uh, that's a wall of books. Uh, and then we get to the end of the room there. Uh, I've drawn the curtains, uh, but up there that we're facing west, and uh, that is the. Uh, um, that's that's that is it. it there. there is over there. I don't know if we can see it. I think it's lurking around about. Well, uh, there's a, a rather nice little statuette of uh, Robert Burns, uh, who, of course, is our great uh, Scottish poet, whose birthday uh, we always celebrate in Scotland at the end of um, end of January, and it's uh, customary to have a Burns supper where people who appreciate Burns, which is uh, most people in, in Scotland, uh, can gather and we have a traditional meal of haggis uh, and uh, um, turnip and, uh, and, and potatoes, neeps and tatties, haggis. And um, then people make uh, speeches. And some of the speeches are, uh, are, are very entertaining. Other speeches, well, you know, they're speeches. And uh, there's also usually a reading of some of Burns a uh, poem. Burns, Burns is, uh, is a wonderful uh, poet because uh, he, he, he spoke and he's spoken down the ages to the most extraordinary uh, range of, of, of people. Uh, he's a universal uh, poet. Uh, he's a very human uh, poet um, and he's vastly popular throughout the world. Um, there, there, there are statues to Robert Burns all over the world. It's an extraordinary, extraordinary thing. Uh, this international appeal. So he was always, for example, very, very popular um, in Russia. Uh, the Russians always rather like Burns. He, he spoke to the Russian soul in, in some way. And um, he's, he's a marvelous poet. And if, if you haven't um, uh, had, had the chance to, uh, to read uh, much Burns, uh, I really can recommend going to, going to him and, and reading. Some of them are in Scots, but you'll usually get um, a glossary which will explain the meaning of some of the Scots words, and then he also wrote in 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 English. 
Um, the Scots is, uh, is, 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 is a language which um, is very similar to English in many respects, but actually has certain features which are, which are quite different and a, quite a wide vocabulary of, um, of words which seem to have nothing to do at all with, uh, with English words. It's a very expressive, uh, it's a very expressive language. And uh, I think a few um, useful words of Scots I can thoroughly recommend to you. And I'd like to give you a couple uh, which uh, uh, you could perhaps note down and please use them. And then it'll be very interesting to see whether we, we hear of more people using a few Scots words, for example, in, uh, in, in, in Washington state. Um, there's a lovely word uh, which um, everybody in Scotland would know uh, to describe um, a rather sort of um, wet and, and unpleasant day. And that's the word dreich, uh, D-R-E-I-C-H, dreich. And that's a very expressive word. The Scots words are often very expressive. Uh, a dreich day. So you'd say, oh, the weather's very dreich. And you can put a lot of expression into it and you can more or less feel the rain as you use the, as the used word. As I use that word, and then there's another marvelous word, one of my favorite Scots word, uh, which is <clears throat> uh, fantouche. I see somebody has just written in uh, uh, Laura Mo. I've got your comment there on the screen. You're saying it's dreich where you are. Well, I'm very sorry. <laughs> I hope the weather improves. <clears throat> there's another another word, which is which is lovely. Um, uh, and we're getting more reports of Greek weather elsewhere in the United States. Uh, another wonderful um, uh, Scots word is uh, fantouche. And uh, that uh, is a word that you would use to describe something which is very flashy and grand and perhaps a little bit over the top. So let's say you bought yourself a new jacket or, a, or some uh, a, a new coat or whatever, and it's it's very smart and 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 clearly a little bit pricey. You would say, "Do you like my nice new fantouche jacket?" And that again is a very very expressive expressive um, uh, word. So uh, Burns, of course, uh, uh, wrote uh, spelling of fantouche. Yeah. Uh, Marcia Rutten saying spelling fantouche. Yes, exactly. You've got it right. F-A-N-T-O-O-S-H. Um, you do see a, another spelling occasionally, but that one, that one will do. Look it up. You'll probably find it uh, online. It did get in to the Oxford English Dictionary. Uh, and somebody very kindly, uh, Anne Payne, is saying, my jacket is fantouche. Ah, oh, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. I'll put it in the in the light a bit more. No, I can't, uh, but it's got stripes. So <laughs> um, this is turning into a fashion discussion. I wish I could see what you uh, readers uh, are, are wearing because we could have a little bit of a discussion about, about that. Anyway, <clears throat> where was I? I think this is, uh, this is <laughs> going in all sorts of directions, but why not? It, why, why not? Things don't have to be, uh, to be uh, linear. But uh, I suppose uh, somebody's asking there that's, uh, Dawn uh, Gibson is saying, are these uh, Gallic words? That's a very interesting question. No, they, they, they aren't. Uh, some of them may derive from uh, Scots Gallic, uh, but they, they aren't necessarily. They're, they're, they're um, uh, somebody saying that they're still in pajamas. So just, <laughs> just as well that we can't see, uh, can't see everybody. Uh, some of the Scots words actually are derived from Gallic and then others come from uh, other sources. So you do get Norse words because uh, we did receive visits from the from the Vikings <laughs> way back. And indeed, you can see the influence of Viking um, encroachment in Scotland. Uh, you can still see the Viking genes around, actually. Uh, I had um, a friend uh, who was absolutely pure Viking. There was no doubt at all about who his ancestors were. Uh, he would have got uh, a job from central casting for any any um, a, a, any film about Vikings, he would have been a very good choi choice for it. And we've got the they they left their influence in place names as well. You'll see some of those. Anyway, let's let's get get on to books because that's uh, really where ah Scots edition. Carol uh, ba um, Barnes has got a Scots edition of Harry Potter. Yeah, well that's very that's very nice. Um, some of my children's books. Uh, interestingly enough, I wrote, wrote um, books about the um, uh, Maramatsui children's uh, uh, children's books, um, and they were translated into Scots. 
uh, and uh, they work very well in 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 Scots. Uh, uh, I didn't know that Harry Potter is translated into Scots, but but but, but there we are. Um, let's get on to uh, some of the books, uh, and uh, I'll say a little bit about uh, two books in particular, which are the most recent uh, recent books, uh, and then um, uh, afterwards uh, we can we can return to. A, uh, a conversation, and I, I do hope that you'll you'll ask me questions because uh, I'm very happy to, uh, to to talk in this way. It's 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 really rather fun. So um, do do um, throw me some questions at the the end of uh, this talk. I'll I'll leave lots of time for us to uh, to do that. Let's take a look at uh, two uh, recent books uh, that uh, have come out. Um, the first one, uh, which I'd say a little bit about, uh, is the latest. Uh, Mara Motswe book uh, in the number one ladies detective agency series. Uh, that I suppose is my best known series of books. Uh, uh, this one is volume 21. We've, we've had 21 of these, uh, these, these books. And um, they uh, started um, over, over 20 years ago, obviously, uh, when I, I first published uh, a, a little book called the number one uh, um, ladies uh, detective agency and that had started as a short story I had written a short story about a woman in Botswana who starts a little detective agency and she uh, goes to see her father on his deathbed and he says when I die sell the cattle and start a little business and she says I know what I'll do <clears throat> I'll start a detective agency and uh, he's not expecting that and so he gasps and uh, and expires and uh, and she um, starts this little detective agency. She hasn't got the first clue about how to be a, a, a private investigator. And she gets this wonderful woman, uh, Grace Makutsi, who comes along and more or less pushes herself into a job as a secretary. She's been at the Botswana Secretarial College where in the final examination, she got the wonderful mark of 97%. And we, we keep hearing about her her great uh, uh, mark at the end of the of the course. And there we are, Michelle Williams is saying, Gase is a wonderful character. She is a wonderful character. She's a marvelous, uh, marvelous character. Um, I, I like uh, Grace Makutsi a great deal. She's a little bit prickly. She's a little bit sensitive. Uh, you have to watch, she's on her dignity. You've got to watch what you say to her, but uh, her heart is in the right place. And of course, gradually she she promotes herself uh, she she decides that uh, she's going to be uh, uh, an assistant de 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 detective and then an associate detective and then a co-detective and so on. And so she really, really has got herself involved in the in the business. And of course, she has a wonderful um, stroke of luck in that she meets a man called Mr. Futi Ratafuti. Uh, she meets him at a dance academy called the Botswana Academy of Dance and Movement. Uh, he can't dance at all well. And uh, uh, he also, uh, she has a little bit of difficulty understanding what he's saying, but she sorts out these, these uh, initial problems and uh, she marries him and he is quite well off. So after having struggled with poverty all her life, Grace Makutsi suddenly discovers uh, that she's in comfort, but she doesn't, uh, she doesn't give up the, um, uh, she doesn't give up the job in the agency. And um, there were, um, where, you know, she 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 uh, has some very strange uh, characteristics. Her 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 shoes talk to her, which is a rather odd thing. Or she thinks the shoes talk to her. And I don't know how I started writing about that. I never thought that I would end up writing books in which one of the characters' shoes talk to her. But there we are. Um, and uh, so I wrote that first book, and then I ended up writing a second book, third book, fourth book. And uh, really, I got rather caught up in it. And uh, I enjoyed it very much indeed. And, uh, and I've been writing them ever since. I do one a year. And I love going back each year to um, Botswana in my mind. I do go back in normal circumstances. I, I visit Botswana every year anyway. But uh, at the moment, obviously, I'm not able to do that. But um, I, I enjoy my uh, annual conversation with uh, Precious Ramotswe and her friends, her husband, Mr. J.L.B. Matakoni, uh, that great um, garagist, uh, a very fine man, quite a shy man, quite a quiet man, it takes quite a long time. He takes about five or six books to get around to proposing uh, to, uh, or actually marrying um, Mara Motswe. 
And um, I, I just love uh, my time with them. And I, in about 10 days time, I shall be sitting right here at this desk and I'll put pen to paper um, metaphorically because I may be typing on the computer, but I shall write uh, the first sentence of um, book number 22. So I'll start writing that and I'll finish that um, round about May. Now I know roughly what it's going to be uh, about, uh, but I don't have all the details. And that book will grow uh, as I, I put myself, as I sit there imagining myself in the, in the, in the office uh, of the number one ladies detective agency. So that, uh, that, that lies ahead. Now, this is, the, this is the current one though, because that will be some time before that next one appears, not having written it yet, but here we are. This is <clears throat> How to Raise an Elephant. And that's got a lovely um, uh, picture um, uh, on, on it uh, of, uh, um, uh, this, this in fact is the, is the UK, uh, um, yes, I'm showing you the wrong edition. Apologies for that. I'm I'm showing the wrong uh, wrong edition altogether because the American edition, which you've got, has got a very different different cover. And rather than leave this room and go into another room where I have um, uh, copies of my uh, all my editions of the books, uh, I'll talk about this. <clears throat> uh, that that is rather a nice um, uh, cover. That that UK cover, but it's the same book that you've got, where you've got another rather nice picture of an elephant by a, a different artist, Ian McIntosh. On, on, on that one. <clears throat> There's an interesting story behind this book. Um, this, uh, I won't tell you the whole story of volume 22, other than that there is an elephant uh, in it, a baby elephant comes, comes into it. But the story behind it is that about um, two years ago, 18 months, two years ago, probably, I was in Botswana, in Northern Botswana, in the Okavanga Delta, uh, which is a wonderful wild part of Botswana, right up in the North, and it's pristine Africa, really beautiful. There's a, a, a big river, the Okavanga River, which flows the wrong way, flows in uh, inland rather than going out to the, to the sea, and then it disappears into the sands <coughs> of the Kalahari. And uh, I'd been there because uh, there was a, a company, a safari company, uh, which, to re which arranged for readers from um, all over the world who wanted to see Botswana and who were interested in Maramotswe to come on the safari which I would uh, attend, my wife and I would attend. And so we did that for quite a few years. I think I did four or five years of, of that. And um, I'd been on one of those trips and was leaving a place called Maung, which is the, the, the main town in that part. And you have to fly from there, uh, either over, over the border into South Africa to Johannesburg or down to Khabarone, where Mara Matsui lives in, in Botswana. And I was waiting to get onto the plane and um, this lady came into the, into the um, terminal, this very small building, very small terminal. And uh, <clears throat> she was saying goodbye to various people who looked as if they were people who knew how to comport themselves in the bush. They were wearing these sort of green outfits and, and, and whatnot. And uh, she was saying goodbye. And I, I found myself wondering, uh, I wonder what, uh, what brings her here into this very remote place. And we got onto the plane as it happens uh, we were seated uh, next to, uh, to one another in the small plane, only about 30 people in it, or if that. And uh, we got talking and um, I said, well, where, where are you from? And she said she was from Dallas, Texas. And uh, I said, well, I actually uh, have been a visiting professor in the past at SMU in Dallas, Texas on two occasions. I spent two, two periods as visiting professor there. And so we chatted and then I discovered that she was a, a keen reader of, of my books. And uh, so we, we talked for a little while and then I asked her what she'd been doing. And she said uh, she was involved in a sanctuary for orphan elephants. And uh, I thought, well, this is rather interesting and I asked her about it. And she said, she explained that um, there are, when poachers shoot the mother elephant, the baby elephant, uh, often remains by the body of the mother. Uh, it's a terribly sad story. So you can imagine this little creature just wondering what has happened to its mother with these cruel poachers who have uh, shot the elephant for the ivory. And um, so they're, they're, if they aren't, if nothing happens, if nobody comes and rescues them, uh, they will die of dehydration or they'll fall victim to predators in that they'll be um, 
um, hyenas or, or, or people like that lurking around ready to come and 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 and, and kill them and um, so they her, her setup that she set up with people some people in Botswana uh, will come and take the baby elephants to a center where they're looked after where they're raised and they have various paddocks uh, every elephant baby elephant has its own quarters and uh, every elephant has uh, a carer and the carer is with the elephant all the time uh, particularly at the beginning when these little creatures will be very confused and wondering when of course they they have to nurse them along they have special um, uh, special um, mixtures um, uh, that they I don't think they can give them cow's milk I, they need to get formula uh, a special formula that's used for for human infants and so they feed them the these and, and gradually bring, bring them their condition up again and the carer stays with them and one of the interesting details of that is the carer has a bed at night they have a raised platform with a bed where the carer sleeps as and um i was told uh that the often in the morning when they go and check up on the elephant they find that the carers got off the raised bed and is sleeping on the ground with the baby elephant the baby elephant has its trunk around the the carer which is a lovely lovely thought anyway this uh this uh, uh lady from dallas uh, who's called deborah stevens uh, she set up a charity called elephant havens and uh i thoroughly recommend that you go and take a look at their website um elephant havens uh it's based in dallas and they this is what they do and i thought what a wonderful wonderful story so i became a bit involved in them so I visited the 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 uh, haven, the elephant haven, um, virtually, and I was taken around and shown um, by camera all around the elephants. And then uh, I was uh, subsequently able to do an event for them in Dallas uh, last year when I was uh, <coughs> when I was there. <coughs> and uh, uh, it's it's uh, just a, a very nice example of um, human kindness towards a very vulnerable little little uh, little creature. And I said to, to Deborah Stevens, well, I'd, I'd like to use the story in a book. And I did. And so I've written her and her people from the Elephant Havens into this, this book. And so they get involved with Mara Matsui and Mara Matsui gets involved with an issue involving a uh, baby elephant. So that's, that's how the, um, the, the book came into existence. And behind every book, uh, there often is uh, a particular story, some sort of um, association for the for the author or somebody has said something to the uh, to the author and uh, that results in 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 a book um, let me uh, say a little bit about uh, uh, another recent book uh, which has just uh, published been published uh, more re more recently than how to raise an elephant and that's a book called pianos and flowers and that's another lovely cover there uh, that's a cover which um, has been designed by uh, my great uh, friend Ian McIntosh, who's a, a very fine illustrator here in Scotland. And he's done that for my New York uh, publishers. And uh, there we see um, a woman uh, having a ride on a bicycle there. Uh, the cyclist, uh, the man is riding along. She's, so they're both obviously enjoying it very much. And they're riding along uh, a street with a, a line of trees in the, the background. Pianos and flowers. Now, what lies behind that? That's a collection of short stories, but a very particular collection of short stories in that each of these stories has been inspired by an old photograph. Now, we all know about these old black and white photographs that we have often in the loft somewhere or in a cupboard somewhere in the house. These old family photographs um, sort of a bit frayed at the edge, black and white photographs, but we often don't know who's in the photograph. We've got absolutely no idea who the people in the photograph are, what they're doing or where they are. Sometimes, of course, we know, oh, yes, that's Aunt Mabel and that's Uncle Harry before he went to South Carolina or whatever it is. And, uh, uh, but often we, we just haven't got uh, any idea at all. And I was asked by a newspaper in the UK, uh, the Sunday Times, uh, to do a series of stories for them. And I said, well, yes, I'll do a series of stories. They wanted me to publish, they wanted to publish six, six stories over six weeks. 
and uh, they hadn't told me any particular sort of story, but just short stories. So I said, well, okay, uh, let me have a look at your, um, uh, at your photo archive, your photographic archive, because it's a very big newspaper here in the UK. They'll have thousands, many, many thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of um, old photographs. And I said, well, even better, find, just find 20 interesting looking photographs uh, that you don't know anything about. You don't know what's going on in the photograph and pass them on to me and I'll uh, collect a number of them. I'll pick 10, uh, well, in fact, six for the paper. I've used more for the book, but I'll collect a number of these photographs and I will write a story about what I think is happening in the photograph, what the photograph suggests to me. So I'll invent characters for those characters we see in the, in, in the photograph and we'll just see what happens. And I did that. And I must say, I really, really loved doing it. It was such fun. I'd done a previous book uh, uh, along the same lines. It was a book called Chance Developments. In fact, that's a copy of the, the paperback edition of it there, Chance Developments. That's exactly the same idea. That's an earlier version where I, I got these various photographs. And on the cover here, you see this uh, very interesting looking photograph which is of a man wearing a rather splendid white hat who is sitting on the lap of that lady there. And there was no explanation about what that was. And so I decided to write uh, a story about that. The title of the story is Dear Ventriloquist. And that lady worked in a circus, interestingly enough, not far from Seattle. I based that in New Westminster, just outside Vancouver, Vancouver, BC, just up the road from many of you. And that's a place that I, I've, I've often spent quite a bit of time. And so this circus was based way back in the 1920s, according to my story, in, uh, in New Westminster, uh, BC, but it also toured, went over the border from um, BC and it toured in, in Washington state and, and Oregon and generally in that, in that area. She was um, a ventriloquist who had an act in the circus and she had a very, um, a very nice a ventriloquist doll. And uh, unfortunately, there's a fire in her caravan uh, when the circus is touring and her caravan is destroyed. She isn't harmed, but the ventriloquist doll is burnt to a crisp. And she's very upset about this because she was very fond of this ventriloquist doll. And that man there, is the lion tamer in the circus in the days when you know circuses still had had lions, and um, she says, "What am I going to do? You know, what am I going to do? I've I've lost my ventriloquist doll." And he says, "Can I help you? Let me help you. Let me act the part of the ventriloquist doll." And there he is doing it, and I'll pretend to be a ventriloquist doll. <laughs> so, so they go on, and. Uh, and it's a great success. It's a wonderful success. Everybody thinks this is very, very amusing and uh, lots of encores. And it's a, it's a great new act. And then of course he asks, he's, he, he's uh, admired her from afar for a long time. And he asks her to marry him. And she says, yes. And that's <laughs> a happy ending. Most of my stories have happy endings. I go for happy endings rather than uh, than sad uh, endings, uh, generally. Um, I think we rather prefer that. And I also, I suppose my my stories are, are more positive. My books are, are, tend to be on the positive end of the spectrum. And why not? Because uh, life isn't always miserable. Life isn't always a veil of tears. And most people uh, lead uh, decent lives. Uh, most people uh, want, to, um, want to be on good terms with their fellow human beings rather than in situations of conflict and confrontation. And I think there's no reason why literature shouldn't reflect uh, that as well. Let me show you, returning to Pianos and Flowers, let me show you one of the photographs there in one of the stories. This is a story called Maternal Designs. And um, there, it's not ideal, but that'll give you... You see there's a building there. You can see a man in the foreground, and that's a large building there which has collapsed, part of the building has collapsed. And the man, I'm sorry, it's not the clearest of images portrayed in this way, but the man there in the foreground in a suit is walking away 
from that collapsed building in a very purposeful way. He is an architect. And so you can probably guess what's coming. He's the architect who designed that building, which has unfortunately collapsed. He's going home. He lives with his mother. He's going home to have a serious word with his mother. He goes in and he says, mother, did you interfere with those drawings that I left on my desk? And she said, oh, he interfered? Of course not, dear. He said, mother, I'm asking you again. Have, did you interfere with those drawings? He said, well, yes, just a little bit, dear. I thought that one of the walls didn't look in the right place, so I moved it. <laughs> Hence that result. And uh, so he has very stern words with her. Mother, you must not practice architecture. <laughs> and uh, who amongst us hasn't had to issue a warning of that sort at some stage in our lives? Interestingly enough, talking about how where these stories come from, some years back, uh, I was at a dinner party in the north of Scotland, and I found myself sit sitting next to a very distinguished civil engineer who had had a, a very illustrious career in the Far East uh, as a well-known um, engineer and, cons and construction man, and he'd done all sorts of very big pro uh, projects, and he was telling me about his experiences there, and then he said, you know, my wife occasionally interfered with my drawings. <laughs> and I said, oh, really? That's very interesting. And bearing in mind that this man built bridges. It was slightly alarming, but apparently his bridges are still standing. So I rather liked the idea of, of mother interfering. I'm going to have to stop because we've got to have time for questions. So before I do so, I'm going to just read something quickly, which if I can find what I was proposing to, to read, I think here it is. Um, this is, uh, I want to read you a poem, uh, which comes from a collection of mine, which is going to be published. It's been published in the UK <clears throat> already, uh, but it um, is uh, not yet out in the, in the US, but will be out in the US later this year. And it's a collection of poetry um, called In a Time of Distance. And that's Another lovely cover there, which I think will be the same cover which the American edition and Canadian edition will be using in a time of distance. And uh, that's got um, uh, a house in the west of Scotland in the Highlands. And there's a suit hanging from the washing line. And that came from an experience I had many years ago, traveling in those parts. I went past this, this house in a very remote place and they'd, they'd washed a suit, a, a men's suit, and they washed it and it was out on the washing line. And I realized, of course, there wouldn't have been dry cleaners for a hundred miles around. So of course you had to wash the, the suit. And I was very struck by that. And so I wrote a poem, which, which actually it's the first poem in this uh, collection, which refers to, to that. I mean, it's the very, I'm not going to read the whole poem, but the first two lines are here on a line outside of Croft, a suit has been hung a dark suit, old fashioned. Uh, it's a poem that I would like to read before we have questions is, is a poem called The Language of Pilots. And this I wrote on an airplane when I'd listened to the way the public address system, the pilots and the, and the cabin crews spoke to us. They didn't use a very personal language. It was an artificial sort of language, not the sort of language that we use in normal conversation. So rather than saying, uh, we're now going down, uh, they, uh, they would say, uh, at this time we are commencing our descent, you know, how artificial and clunky. And I thought, what, what would it be like if a, if a pilot spoke in a poetic way and used poetic uh, English? And I wrote this poem uh, about imagining a, a, a pilot who used beautiful poetic language. It's called The Language of Pilots. They speak with high authority, ailrons and wings responsive to their touch. Their words are functional too. But why, I wonder, should a pilot not be a poet too and say, we now descend at last through banks of cloud, white fields as wide as any ocean, at least when viewed from where we are, at least when viewed from this suspended point. For it is Bernilli's principle that lifts and keeps us here between the patient earth below 
and this empty, soaring sky. Ladies and gentlemen, rain falls in distant veils. Look from your windows to the starboard side of this metal tube we call an aircraft. Look out there and see the rain, the gray white shafts of rain. Do you know that those wisps of cloud you see up above are crystals of ice falling like gossamer? Did you know that? Now please, about your waists, affix the belts, you must, as slowly towards the earth we drop to lands embrace your belts adjust. We are a little late, but what are a few minutes? Nothing more here and there, not much, I think. Goodbye and take with you the things you brought, your few possessions. Goodbye until we meet again. And once more we carry you on wings of steel, on wings of steel, to places you would wish to go. Goodbye, dear friends. It matters not whether you're a member of the loyalty scheme we've got. We love you all as parents love their children equally. Remember that and please come back. Goodbye again and cabin crew, unbar the doors, let light be seen, secure what needs securing and cross check whatever that may mean. Goodbye. For soon these great engines on landing will be silenced, as will I. So that's from In a Time of Distance, a poem called The Language of Pilots. Now we need to we need to talk to one another. <laughs> I've been talking quite enough, and I would like to, to be able to talk to, to you if anybody has any questions or complaints. You may have complaints about the books. People like to complain about books. Don't hesitate to complain. Not too much, please. Preferably not, but nonetheless. There we are. <laughs> Ali, there we are. I can see you now. <laughs> All right. I am back just to read some questions. I see we have so many in the uh, Q&A box. Thank you guys so much. Um, and I am going to start with this question from Vanessa, because I think that it sort of touches on something that a lot of people are curious about. Uh, it says... It's fascinating to hear how you write in many locations. I enjoy how frequently your books come out. How uh, do you write in just just one book at a time, or do you have multiple books across several series on the go? Uh, I, I prefer writing one book at a time, but I often have two books going at at the same time um, because I I, I suppose uh, I publish about five books, five or six books a year, and so that means that they can. Of overlap. Um, and uh, if I'm doing that, I have to be careful to remember which one I'm writing at, <laughs> at the time. Generally speaking, I manage to keep the fictional universes apart. But um, no, I do, I do have more than more than one. And I might write one in the morning and one in the in the evening. It all depends. So Lisa is asking, um, oh, oh, I'm wrong. Linda, excuse me, is asking, uh, do you write by hand? I don't see a computer on your desk. Uh, well, uh, I do. Um, uh, actually, I'm I'm facing the I'm facing the computer on. It's a side desk here. I have the computer. Then I might use the laptop on that one. I, I most of the time I write um, on a word processor on com a computer uh, these days. But I also write. I do write by hand. Um, I write um, particularly if I'm writing per, uh, poetry. I write by hand. But I'll also do uh, other. Um, I, I have these notebooks. I, I have a large number of these these rather nice uh, notebooks. And um, you'll see there that I, that's an example of my writing by hand. Um, so I, and I've got my, my, my pen right, right here. So, so I do write by hand as well. It's slightly different. Uh, there's a slightly different voice writing by hand. I think word processing uh, uses different um, uh, connections in the, in the brain. So let's see, Karen wants to know, uh, do your characters come to you fully formed or do they grow for you throughout the series? Uh, the characters, uh, thank you, Karen. That's, uh, that's very interesting. The, the, um, the characters uh, usually grow as, as I write the, uh, write the series. I've got a general idea of them. Uh, my new Swedish series, the Ulf Varg series, the Department of Sensitive Crime series, uh, he has uh, grown um, uh, quite a bit since I first encountered him. I've just discovered more about him. I think that's what probably uh, uh, probably happens. But uh, 
sometimes they're more formed when when I start and other occasions um, they're they're less formed and then they they emerge as I spend time with them. So John is wondering, this is kind of connected, um, do you like how the actors have portray portrayed your characters in the TV series? Yes, I thought they did a very good job. The, the TV series was an HBO series um, uh, a few years back uh, of the number one ladies detective agency. Uh, Jill Scott played uh, Mara Matsui and I thought she played her very, very well. Uh, Annika Nonny Rose played uh, Grace McCootsey. Uh, Lucian M. Smarty played Mr. J.L.B. Matacone, and I thought they were they were uh, they were excellent. They really they really got them. I hadn't met them before they started filming. I did. I went out and saw the filming in Botswana, and that's when I met the uh, met the actors, and um, uh, I I was very pleased, very pleased. So. Aaron says, I wanted to say thank you for your wonderful series. After difficult days at the hospital, it has been a wonderful escape and solace to lose myself in your books. I love all your characters and I've always wondered if you based anyone on yourself. Are you hidden in your own books? <laughs> well, firstly, th thank you for your, your very kind remarks. And uh, um, when you're referring to hospital, I assume that you're working in hospital, in which case I think these are circumstances in which we probably would all thank you for your your work in these these uh, trying times. Um, do I ever put myself into the book? No, I, I don't think so. I don't think so. People sometimes say to me, oh, you're Isabel Dalhousie, aren't you? Or you're Bertie. They often accuse me of being Bertie in the Scotland Street books. But uh, I would say probably there are there are bits. I mean, I, I find that I agree with Mara Motswe on just about um, everything. And so you can draw your own conclusions from that. So Alicia wants to know, how long does it usually take you to write a book? And do you ever get writer's block? Um, I take about um, three months to write a book. Uh, one of the novels usually takes me about three months, three to three and a half months is about how long it, it takes. Uh, that's working on it uh, every day. Uh, I work at uh, odd times. Uh, I'm often, I often write at three or four in the morning. I get up and I'll be here um, between say three and six o'clock and th then I'll go back to bed and go back to sleep. Uh, so I, d I do keep strange, uh, strange hours. I'll write for about, probably write for about three hours a day, something like that. I can do more if necessary. Uh, but I write quite quickly. So if I'm writing three hours a day, I will have written 3,000 words. I write 1,000 words an hour. Uh, it's, uh, it's interesting. I, I don't really have to think too much about what's going to happen. It just, just, just comes out as if I'm hearing music. It's, uh, it's odd. So I have a number of questions about this. Evelyn and Nancy are wondering about the really terrible orchestra. <laughs> <laughs> Are you still playing your bassoon at home during this pandemic? I imagine the really terrible orchestra is on a hiatus due to the uh, pandemic. Well, I, I, I haven't been to many recent rehearsals, even before the lockdown. I wasn't at many re recent rehearsals. I'd rather slip because I've been away from home so much. My wife goes to all the rehearsals. I go to them occasionally. Uh, in my case, it doesn't really matter because no matter how much I rehearse, I'm never going to get any better. Uh, I do, uh, so I'm still on, on the books of the, of the Really Terrible Orchestra. The Really Terrible Orchestra has been meeting virtually this last year. So uh, what they do is that they all, um, they all sign on to, Zoom, I think it's on Zoom, and the, um, nobody can hear the individual members. So they hear the conductor, what he's telling them, to do and he will be at the piano and he'll instruct them and uh, then they play their parts so um, they can't they can't hear uh, what the other people um, so are, are, are doing so it's not entirely satisfactory but of course with an orchestra like the really terrible orchestra if other people can't hear what you're playing that's really quite a positive thing because everyone's so bad Thank <laughs> you. 
Um, so let's see here. Uh, Laura wants to know, do you have a first reader for each book before you submit? Um, no, a first reader, did you say? Yes. A first reader. Um, not, well, not always, not officially. Um, uh, the, the, the person who, who, who really counts as the editor in the publishing, uh, in the publishing firm. So I have uh, three, uh, four uh, main, uh, actually four main editors uh, in the English language. And of course I've got editors in other languages, but, but four main English language uh, editors, the ones that, with whom I have most, most dealing as an editor in, 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 in London, um, as an editor in New York and an editor in Toronto. I've got an editor, uh, editor in Edinburgh here in Scotland as well. So they will get the they will get the manuscript after I've written, and that's the serious reading. That's when they'll say, um, you know, cut that out or make that a little bit longer. They don't really say very much, um, but they do. They will make uh, small uh, suggestions, uh, also suggestions of continuity if there's some problem with the continuity of what's going on in the in the book. But I do have friends um, uh, who read them. And so I will show uh, show friends the 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 manuscripts. I'm I'm writing a, a, um, a book at the moment, uh, which is um, set in uh, Sri Lanka. It begins in Sri Lanka or Ceylon, as it then was in 1930, ends in Edinburgh, 1982. And as I've been writing that, I've been showing that to a friend of mine who's actually with us at the moment. He lives in France. My friend uh, Alan Hanna. He's been reading. He's been reading this. Manu manuscript this book as as I go along and he's been making suggestions about what might might happen was very useful so I do have a few friends that I I uh, show the books to <clears throat> so we have a uh, an uh, audience member asking in pianos and flowers is the story about Watson and Crick and the pogo sticks <laughs> giving them the idea of the double helix is that true <laughs> <laughs> it's I'll show you the photograph of that that's the the photograph that's the photograph which made me write that story you see there's there's a man there on a pogo stick jumping up and down on pogo stick there are two of them and um, I've actually identified where that photograph is from I don't know who's on the pogo stick uh, but it looks as if it's the 1930s or something like that and um, maybe it should actually be later for Watson and Crick but um, uh, it is Cambridge in in England, the University of Cambridge. It's just outside one of the colleges, the University of Cambridge, and <clears throat> the story there, and it's complete, completely false. I mean, it's completely made up. Is that these two young scientists had been in their lab? It's lunchtime, and they they're going out just to get a breath fresher, and somebody gives them a pogo stick, says, try this. So they get on the pogo stick and they jump up and down on the pogo stick. And then they take the pogo stick back into the lab and they look at it and they say, this is interesting. Look at this spring, this double helix spring that's inside the pogo stick. And one says, Watson says to Crick or Crick says, that gives me an idea. <laughs> so that's complete invention. <laughs> utterly untrue it would be nice if it were true It'd be nice if they if they'd see they'd come up with the idea of the double helix structure of dna by looking at a pogo stick <laughs> <laughs> but i write fiction <laughs> <laughs> so vanessa says over 20 years i feel like i've got to know many of your characters like far off friends of friends and think of them when i heard international news uh, this year, I found myself wondering how your characters spread around the world have fared with the pandemic. And happy endings, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. I'm glad that you feel that sort of sense of identification with the characters, because that's what I feel. And I feel that uh, as the author of these uh, these books and, and, and you as the readers, that we're all members of the same group of friends. I feel that we all know one another. So we all know Bertie, we all know Isabel Dalhousie, we know Grace Makutsi, we know Mara Motswe. And that's the most wonderful privilege for me uh, to be involved in that. I'm, I'm so grateful to you, the readers, for creating this big uh, international club 
it's big international family with and we share our concerns for Bertie and 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 so on. I think that that's that's something which uh, I get great great solace from. So we are about at the end of our time, um, but just really quickly, people are wondering about your favorite mystery authors and what you are reading. Well, <clears throat> I don't read a great deal of, of mystery. Uh, I, uh, um, I, I, I read a, a bit of it, but I, I, my, my reading is very, very broad. I, I read probably rather more, um, rather more nonfiction uh, these days than I read fiction. I read a lot of poetry. Um, w. H. Auden is my my favorite poet uh, by a very long chalk, but I do read a lot of poetry, and uh, as I say, a lot of um, a lot of of nonfiction. Uh, so, um, what am I reading right at the moment? Well, I've got it right on this desk here, as it happens. Um, it's um, a re remarkable book, Simon Winchester, Land, and it's a it's a it's a big fat book, a very interesting one about uh, how we. Um, feel about land, how we relate to land, and how important land and um, uh, title to land can can be. Uh, if you look at many of the world's problems, there are disputes over ownership of land or control of land, control of territory or whatever. So it's a very, very significant subject uh, for us. And this, um, this new book, it's just come out. Um, the Simon Winchester book is, re is really really fascinating. He starts off by talking about how he bought 120 acres or something like that in New York State and how for the first time in his life he owned a bit of land and he had a title deed and he began to think what did this signify? What was the story behind it? And of course if you look at any any issue of land you'll find that uh, anywhere in any country of the world at any time uh, there's usually some issue about who took that land from somebody else in the in the past? Uh, this goes way back in human history. Land has been passed from person to person, often taken from person to person, and so it's 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 it becomes a, a contested area of our history. Uh, it's something that people are very emotional about. It's a very very interesting subject. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, so we are a little bit over time, even. Um, but the last question uh, that I had for you is what should we look for coming, um, coming from your direction over the next year or so? Uh, well, I think there are various books which are in the pipeline. Uh, there's this one, which I think is going to be coming out in, in the States in, uh, May, Tiny Tales. And that's, um, that's a collection of very, very short stories, often just a page or two, where included in it are various um, uh, little um, uh, illustrations, little uh, strip illustrations by Ian McIntosh, my illustrator. And they are wonderful. He's, he, he really does this beautifully. That one's about a boy called Icarus, who, uh, <laughs> whom we've, we've heard of in the past. That's about Freud's mother and what it's like to be, what it must be, have been like to be Freud's mother. And so these stories are a few pages and um, I really, uh, really enjoyed writing them. That comes out in, in May. Um, my book of poetry, uh, which I mentioned, uh, also quite soon will be volume three of my Swedish series, my Ulf Varg series. He's a Swedish detective. Um, Ulf Varg, the department, he works in the Department of Sensitive Crimes in Malmo, and uh, that's, I have great fun writing those. Uh, he's a very nice character, Ulf Varg. Uh, he has the usual issues that Swedish detectives have, you know, Swedish detectives all have to have problems. They won't get a job unless they've got, uh, they've got pr problems. Um, and uh, he, uh, um, he, he, he has very peculiar cases, nothing terribly serious, very odd little cases. Volume three of that is coming out uh, quite soon in the next few months, I think. And that is called The Man with the Silver Saab. He's got a beautiful Swedish car, a silver Saab. He's also got a dog called Martin, uh, who's hearing impaired. Uh, Ulf is having therapy, of course, psychotherapy, as all Swedish detectives must have and his dog is having therapy as well. His dog is hearing impaired, he's got additional problems, but he's been taught to lip read. 
He's the only dog in Sweden who can lip read, only in Swedish, but nonetheless he can lip read. So you get, you get the feeling of that series. That is so wonderful and I love it so much. <laughs> <laughs> so this chat, has been absolutely lovely. This is a total testament. What you guys have all been saying this whole time is just a total testament to how wonderful your books are and how much joy people have been getting from them, especially over this last chaotic year. So I just want to say thank you so, so much for being here. This has been such a wonderful discussion. Um, everyone in the audience, thank you so much for being here. I'm so sorry I couldn't read every question and comment. I wish that I could have. And I think this is where we're going to call it a day. So everyone go run over to the um, to the website, grab books, or come on in if you're local. We would love so much to see you. Um, thank you all. <laughs> thank you very much and goodbye everybody until we meet again, I hope next time in, in the flesh, in the real. <laughs> yes. <Goodbye. laughs> uh, thank you so much for a lovely conversation. Thank you. <laughs>